Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm your host, Lori Lee. Can we agree that our thought habits basically build our worlds? How small we stay, how big we become, what we allow, what we don't allow, how much we sacrifice, how hard money is to come by, etc., etc. These are all the type of thoughts that we function from because they're what we believe, they're how we see the world. In today's show, we're talking about thought habits with the expert, Amy Kemp, author of I See You. We'll hear a little bit more about that. So stay tuned for my in-depth conversation with this certified habit finder coach who has worked with literally hundreds to help people see how their habits impact their lives and how we can replace unhealthy thought habits with more healthy ones. So stay with us. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story power serves you best when you know how to use it. Amy Camp not only coaches, but she also gives workshops, speaks on stage, and has now released her new book, I See You. I'm excited to sit with Amy and learn and share as we talk about this powerful piece of our lives, our habits. So let's hop right in. Amy, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. Um, I just finished your book. And at the start of your book, you shared this wonderful story of meeting with a woman for the first time, a woman who, as you have coffee with her, she shares her career path, her accolades, her successes, a woman who looked to have everything together. And when she asked why you had asked her to lunch, you said, because I see you, because I really see you. This brought the woman to tears in your story. But can we start with what do you mean by I really see you? Mm, so good. I think there's layers of what we see in people. And in that particular instance, this woman is very visible in our community. And so I think assumptions are made about the quality of her life or what the experience of moving through the world is like for her that aren't always accurate. And I do think that sometimes we don't see those people uh, who are in the spotlight a lot as people. And so uh, the experience of being a woman, particularly a woman who leads, can be isolating and lonely. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. You know, most of the time you're in rooms with mostly men or you're leading the women who are in the room. And so it's not appropriate for you to be friends with them. And so the question just becomes who's holding space for you? Who sees you? And does anyone really see you and really know that sometimes you're not okay? Sometimes you are, but sometimes you're not also. And so the, your book, let's just talk a little bit about it. I see you. Why did you write this? I mean, obviously it was a lifetime goal to write a book, but I really wrote the book for a specific reader. And that is a woman who has done some things. She's she's created some things and she's gotten to a level of success and still has kind of a burning desire for more income and impact and influence, but it is impossible for her to work more. And so it just becomes this question of, I still have this burning desire what then? How would I ever be able to have a greater impact or income or influence if I'm not working more hours? Like I maxed um, out, right? I maxed, maxed out, I'm out. Doing everything I can do, but I, I haven't reached that pinnacle yet. Yep, absolutely. Right. Uh, and yet there's something more for me to do. I know it deep inside. In all your work, as you've been coaching people and helping them with habits, how much are the habits that we have a part of how much we are able to do? Well, first of all, we are largely unaware of how much of an impact our subconscious habits of thinking are having on us on a daily basis. It is Absolutely. very rare that someone's paying attention to that because it's happening at a subconscious level. <laughs> well, and even people that are very self-aware 
you know, I have a lot of very self-aware friends. I think I'm pretty self-aware, mm-hmm. but when I stop and think, oh, what are my habits? Like I, I can only think of a few of them and I know there's a lot. So habits are just, you know, it's ways that we see the world and we think that's reality. Mm-hmm. We're not realizing that it's a habitual thought process. So this is going to be really totally. interesting. Yeah. And we, uh, there are symptoms that are external, meaning behaviors that people see that are a result of these deeper habits of thinking that we try to change all the time. They're always in the areas of New Year's resolutions, yes. <laughs> you know, budgeting, I'm going to exercise more. It's the thing that you know you should do, but you're just not doing it. Then I always know, ooh, let's dig in there. There's something happening at the subconscious level. But also that can- you from the outside, right? But what it really yes. needs to do is be changed from the inside. Anything external is fleeting. I mean, it will last a short period of time, but eventually you'll return back to where- uh, your subconscious mind is sort of set. The temperature gauge is set inside of you. This but it, it it can also happen, you know, where you want to earn more money, but you can't work any more hours. And so then what do you do? Or you want to create something you've never created before and you just can't seem to move it past that certain point. That's usually where I know, okay, something is happening below the surface that has to be addressed. In order for you to go further, we have to dig deeper and get down to the root of what's really going on um, in that subconscious mind to kind of free you up to move forward. So what does a certified habit finder coach do? You Mm -hmm. dig into that subconscious stuff? Mm -hmm. So there's an assessment tool uh, that you actually can take for free on my website. It's amykemp.com. And it takes about 10 minutes. You want to do it. It works on a phone, but it's better to do from a computer where you have a keyboard or um, some sort of cursor that you can use. And the habit finder tool basically is like a snapshot of your subconscious habits of thinking. So we start there and just sort of find out what's happening. What are your areas of risk? It's measuring risk. It's not measuring personality. It's not measuring strengths. It's not measuring any of that. It's measuring what are the risks of my brain falling into certain grooves where there are deep, well-worn paths. And then there's the curriculum that corresponds with it that is designed to replace those areas of high risk with more, uh, with with habits of thinking that serve you better. So can I, can I give you an example? Oh, like I of a, love that. That's what I was going to say. What's an example yeah. of a high-risk area? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a really common one for a lot of women is obligation. They're operating in this space of have to, need to, should. I have to, need to, should. Ha- and maybe it starts at work, but then it bleeds into every area of your life. Oh, I really have to go to the gym. I really should you know, go get groceries tonight. I really need to follow up with you know, my aunt who hasn't been doing well. And what happens when you have that subconscious habit of thinking is that you do the thing, but it adds another layer of resistance to doing it. So it's sort of like, it takes effort to exercise or to check in on your aunt or to do the work project. But adding this habit of thinking is like strapping on a hundred pound backpack and then doing it. It it's just a, a colossal waste of energy and time. It's drag, and you know, there's energy leaking out from you basically because of that habit of thinking. And so if we can get rid of that and then just do the thing, you end up conserving and saving so much energy in that resistance. So how do you get rid of the the thought process of I should do this? You replace it with I get to I choose to, I want to. I am blessed to. (laughs) Okay, I like that. I like that. We've talked about that before. And I actually have an activity that I do when I speak Mm -hmm. and work that. And it's it starts out with I have to do these things and then it shifts to I get to do these things and then it shifts to I am blessed to do these things. And it's amazing how the energy of the person shifts. It in me too. You just shift that one word and suddenly the whole thing that you felt like you had to do becomes something different. It's very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. The same can be true for being in resistance. I just was working with a client. She had a great boss and then she had a not great boss. And this not great boss sort of did some damage to her self-esteem, her confidence, just kind of was micromanaging and questioning. And my client 
was in a lot of resistance to that, you know, really kind of fighting back, kind of making a case for why this new boss wasn't very good. And all of that was true, right? All of that was true. However, the resistance to it was sucking up all of this time and energy. And so what we were shifting it to was that new boss, she's doing the best she can with where she is. Mm. So how did that, how did it release her energy? Did she feel better? Okay. Did it shift? Really so what you're shifting is you're shifting the story inside so our true. heads about whatever it is going on. Yep. So that happened. We just worked on shifting that one thing. Like it doesn't make what that boss was doing. Okay. It right. doesn't even make her, it doesn't change anything about the reality of the situation. But when the energy was freed up, this is what always happens out of the blue in quotation marks, right? Something else, a different opportunity showed up for my client that is much more abundant, much more lucrative, mu very expansive feeling even and, and excitement for this opportunity within the same company. And she had been trying to find a different role for probably 18 months and couldn't because she was in this energy of resisting the thing. But it was like, as soon as we changed the subconscious thought habit to just acceptance, it is what it is. That person is doing the best she can. I'm not going to change it. I'm here. I'm doing the best I can under these circumstances. Then there was the space within which the new thing could show up. And so, you know, I find, I find when we have a story going on in our mind and all humans do this, but when you become aware and start watching it, right? So sometimes we'll think something's going to happen, like maybe an interaction with this boss, right? And so you'll start creating this, ooh, when this happens, oh. I'm going to do this or, and then she's going to say this and then this and, and, and you kind of create it in your head, a reality that hasn't even taken place, but you've created emotions about that, that are all are a part of you now, even though this thing never even happened, right? And oh, so yeah. when you start taking that apart and realizing how much power we have in our own minds to create stories, real or not yet happened, the energy, the emotion, the like use that for good once you realize what you can do with it, because totally. exactly what you're saying, all that resistance, all that e emotion that's tied up in her anger and frustration with this boss. Wow. That's a heavy burden. And she right. and, the, and the boss doesn't even know. Even know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the boss is wasting no energy on it, right? That's the other thing. In the book, I say this, um, if you're going to make up a story, you might as well make up a good one, right? Yes, so I agree. Like the thing happens and then you have the choice about how you want to frame that or what story you want to tell around what happened. And that story will dictate a lot of how you show up in the next interaction. And all of that is usually happening at a subconscious level. So that's the kind of work that I'm doing all the time with people is like digging into those deeper stories to replace them with a better version. Okay. Uh, that, that makes sense. So yeah. they kind of take this habit finder test and then you work with them looking at things that are working or not working and exploring mm -hmm. their stories and helping them create um, stories that are going to support them and not cripple them. A hundred percent. Or Beautiful. even you can do catastrophe or fantasy, right? You can create a fantasy of you haven't even done one tiny step toward creating the new thing, the the new mm. project, the new book, you know, the, the sales call, the whatever, but you've already cashed the check at the bank that you've earned from <laughs> creating it in your head. And then when it takes longer or it's slower, you feel discouraged and you feel disappointed with the reality. Instead of going to the vision in your head, having the vision for what you want to create isn't bad. It's no, that it's you key, go really. to it for inspired ideas and next steps, and then you come back to reality and live in reality of doing the millimeter steps of creation, the millimeter steps of getting your hands into the clay that you've been given and molding it and shaping it and really working with what's right in front of you. Uh, instead of living in your head and all of these made up potential scenarios. Taking action is a very important part of making anything happen. Absolutely. When you are working with these habits, what are just maybe a handful 
three of the top Mm -hmm. most unhealthy habits that you think we get caught up in? Yeah. One is um, attaching my happiness, my, my giving myself permission to feel happy until I get to a desired outcome that's Mm -hmm. out there, usually out in the future. Uh, sure. you know, I'm, I'll be happy someday when I get here or when I achieve this level of sales or when I get to this level of promotion in my company or when I, there's so many different conditions we can put when I weigh this amount, when I, yeah. I mean, just ridiculous things that we create out of, I don't even know where, right. But we're constantly doing that. And it's robbing us both of the joy of the experience of the journey, right. We're in resistance then, uh, but it's also, It's also damaging to our self-esteem because we're thinking, what's wrong with me that I'm not there yet, that I haven't achieved that thing yet, that I'm not there. So that would definitely be one that I see a ton, especially with people who are entrepreneurs or who think like entrepreneurs. Well, and Um, there's a space for that too, where that that leaves us always in a space of seeking for happy. I'll be happy when, Mm -hmm. but as soon as we achieve that thing, there's another thing on the horizon. And so that happy space is very short lived. And so you've got to realize if you don't enjoy the journey, cliche as it is, but if you're not enjoying the process of what you're creating and celebrating all the little wins every day, that your life is going to just be this set of always chasing. So what a great yeah. thing to bring to mind. Okay, when you get one? there, you still have that habit of thinking. So it's yeah. still with you, <laughs> you know? Probably another one that's really tender and really meaningful is that we have conditions placed on our value. So if you can imagine, um, like if you could imagine the palms of my hands on one, if I had written the word value and then the other performance. So many times we are saying, if I do this, then I am valuable. If I, you know, earn this amount, then I am valuable. We're attaching conditions instead of it being I am, therefore I am valuable. So if those if those two words are on my the palms of my hands, if you can imagine me clasping them together, when those things are attached, when your value is attached to your performance, whether that be in sales, the size of your business, your income, the size or shape of your body, what your title is, how many degrees you have. When those things are attached, if you can just imagine your hands clasped together so tightly, you can't get your hands into the clay that you've been given to mold and shape and work. It's like you're frozen by the attachment of those two things. Whereas if I just am and I'm valuable, And then I get to play around with this thing called performance. My hands are free to move about. I can work with them. I can move. I'm not so scared and clenched up. But the process of separating those two things is a healing journey. It's a long journey of of learning that our value doesn't come from that performance, for sure. How how do you help people on that journey? Because that's a very real, Mm -hmm. cultural, culturally embedded belief. It is deep. (laughs) Very. That's a hard question to answer because it's so different for each person. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest thing is the awareness, the awareness that I'm not a teacher, I teach. The awareness that I'm not a business coach, I coach people. Like I'm not what I do right? That's just something I do. So if you imagine like a child playing with blocks, they're not a block builder. They're just playing with blocks. And so if the blocks fall, you know, if the business fails or the business has a downturn or you lose the job or you don't achieve the sales goal, like the blocks just fell over. A child would just look at that and say, oh, well, I didn't I need a different block on the bottom or I need to try something different or they're just like, well, that was fun. you know. <laughs> and mm-hmm. then they kind of move on because they're not attached to that as their value. And so I think it's keeping, this is a, I talk about this in the boundaries uh, chapters of the book, but this boundary between that thing we do and who we are is also important. Like we aren't what we do. Um, we are just separate from it and we're just doing it out here. We were doing out here in front of us. Um, okay. Yeah. So in your book, you quote um, Prentice Hemphill on her definition of boundaries, which it says, quote, boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. I thought that was lovely. 
kind of poetic. Uh, um, it's one of my favorites. So let's talk a little bit then about thought habits and boundaries. What are, how does that work into your, mm-hmm. when you're working with people? How do you see those two meshing? One of the main ways is having a boundary between um, my idea and myself. I'm not my ideas. Uh, I give this example in the book of my husband. This is actually not a true story, but he, we we kind of came up with it together, he and I, because we were talking about this concept where he's a principal at a high school and he hates the way the bus lanes run. It's He thinks unsafe and there's a better way to do it. And he's been kind of stewing on this for a long time, like how these lanes could be changed and made more efficient. If he goes into the admin meeting and this idea that he has If he's attached to it, like it is a part of him, he's thought about it so much. It's as if my very tall husband climbs up in the middle of the board table, holding this idea tightly to his chest and he presents it. And then people start to poke at it or to question it or to say, I'm not sure that would work because of this. If he's sitting on the table with it, that all feels so personal versus can he just come in with the idea in a backpack, sit down, take off the backpack, pull it out, put it in the middle of the table and say, I have this idea. And together, everyone pokes at it, right? We're all just looking at it, turning it over, you know, kind of like, will this work from different perspectives? What would be the potential problems? He's not attached, so he can receive all of that feedback without it feeling personal. But when we are obsessive thinkers and we're thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking all the time, we get very attached to our ideas. And then it feels very personal when people attack them. This is why we're having so many issues right now with people not having tolerance for people with differing beliefs than they have because we've gotten so attached to them as a source of our identity, right? Feels personal Um, versus this is an idea. I may believe in it. I may love this idea. I may really think this is truth, right? This is my idea, but it's not me. This is such an important thing to talk about because it's absolutely true. And it also just comes back again to the stories we're creating in our mind, how we are framing something and how we approach it. If we could all comprehend, and this is what the whole Love Your Story podcast is about, is trying to help Mm -hmm. people understand the power they have over their own stories. And that changes everything because what you're talking about there is how do I package this in my head as I go out into the world with it? And one way is going to be successful and one way is going to be a lot more painful. Absolutely. And sometimes the idea does need to change, right? I mean, maybe his idea wasn't the best idea. (laughs) Maybe there were things he didn't know or hadn't considered or perspectives that he wasn't aware of. So we can actually make the idea better if we're open to feedback on it or open to discussion and we're not attached to it. That's a really important thing um, in every setting. In your book, you have another quote that I really liked. It says, what if everything we want and are trying to create depends on only one thing, how connected we are to the source from which Mm. all things come? Do you believe in this? Mm. Tell me why. I know it to be true to my toes. (laughs) (laughs) I know it to be true because when I'm open and receiving, things happen through me that could never happen on my own. I don't try. I just am more in a responsive mode and in a like receive and respond kind of a rhythm. And the whole experience of creating, even like creating Amy Kemp Inc., the business, for example, I had no long-term strategic plan. I didn't know it would become what it's become. I had no idea. I just knew the next thing. And then I would receive the next thing and take action on it. And there was this feeling of this greater energy in my faith practice, I would call it the Holy Spirit moving through me and out into the world. But people of all faith practices um, have this same experience of, I came from this source. This source has unlimited supplies of abundance and energy and wisdom and ideas and resource, right? And when I'm open and allow it to move through me and out into the world, I feel most alive. 
I feel most energized and I'm able to see things created that I never could have dreamed of on my own or even imagined. They're just, it's just so, it's so much more than what I thought. So how do you help people stay open? What does being open Mm -hmm. look like? And what if you open up and then like nothing really flows? It's just you and the world, (laughs) you know, just flowing along. Talk to me about that. Then I would say you're not open. Mm. Uh, There's something else there. And that's actually, it can be things like physical pain that you're not dealing with, like, um, you know, an injury or something you haven't addressed that's been bothering you with your body can be unhealed emotional pain. Sometimes I've seen this happen where, you know, someone would hire me, they want to earn more money or they want to build their business to a bigger level, but they have this relationship where they're being mistreated in their life and they can get to a certain point with the business, but they can't seem to get beyond it. And it's not because there's anything wrong with their business skills or the model or anything like that. It's that they're not dealing with this relationship where they're allowing themselves to be mistreated. And so there is a blockage or sometimes most of the time for me, it's these subconscious habits of thinking. So maybe you're not aware that it's clogged up or stuck or, you you know, you're not receiving, but um, because it's happening at that subconscious level. And so we've got to really dig in there because once it's cleared, I've never seen like always the opportunity shows up, the resource shows up, the the new job shows up, the business partner shows up, the whatever shows up, the person that you want to be in a romantic relationship shows up, but there's something blocking it if you're not receiving. Interesting. Okay. So mm-hmm. I wanted to just expound on this a little bit. And actually, do you mind if I read a, a bit yeah, from your book? Please do. Okay. So Page 84, you say faith is the fuel that keeps the subconscious mind working. And I, I I, love this because I feel like faith is a really powerful thing. And you say, finally, the fuel that keeps the subconscious mind working is faith, that what we are imagining and desiring will come to pass. The bigger the belief, the more power the subconscious mind can use to create the ideas needed to bring this desire into reality. It's like faith is the push that swings open the door between us and the power of the universe. Without it, our thoughts have little power. And really what you're getting to here is if we internally believe in something, believe we can have something, believe we can do something, believe in the thing we're going for, then combining with the universe, like it it can come into place. But if we don't really believe we're good enough or, or we don't really believe we can mm-hmm. have a thing or we don't really believe we can do a thing or that it's possible, then it's much less likely to happen. And you say, we don't have to know how to create what we want. We have to grow the belief that what we want is absolutely available to us. Mm-hmm. And I thought this was really interesting because I read something else the other day that was saying, and maybe it was even in this book, but I, I jotted it down and it was, <laughs> if you don't believe that you are someone who can earn a six-figure income, you know, a $100,000 job, and you're looking for jobs, you're not going to apply for the $100,000 job. You know, you're just not going to. And But if you believe you do and you see that job available, you're going to. And I thought, that is so true. What you believe you can have or can do is the absolute crux to what you will make happen. Anyway, t- tell us more about this. It's so true. I just, we, I had my book launch workshop last week and I just got a text from someone who attended. And right after she left the workshop, she negotiated a $40,000 raise. Sweet. And I said, what changed? And she said, because the, you know, the, the opportunity didn't change the, like she could have asked for it at any time. There could have been at any, and she just said, I was in that room and I started to realize like, if these people are are worth it and I'm like them, they're just normal. I'm talking to them. I'm like, I'm worth it. And I can ask for more. And it was that kind of like shift inside of her of believing she was worth it, not attached to any conditions. She just was worth it. Uh, that really caused, I think, this door to open for her, right? And here's the other cool thing about that. It doesn't have to take a long time. I've seen the craziest things happen where people make shifts inside of them and then 
it's fast. Like the, all of a sudden that the movement of whatever it was they were seeking comes toward them. So I'm not saying this in a way like um, there's no work to it or there's no effort or there isn't any um, contribution on your part. I'm not, I'm not saying that though. Sometimes that does happen too, but I'm, what I'm saying is just work on the belief part, pay attention to what shows up instead of trying to orchestrate all the hows and figuring it out and maneuvering all the external things, right? Work on you, get your roots really deep, really wide, really rooted and grounded. And, and, and then just pay attention. You, there's not, you don't, you can ease up on the how you can ease up. You can just relax about the how. Can you give us some tools? Like if you mm-hmm. were giving us a habit tool, what I'm hearing when we're talking about habits and tell me if I'm wrong, but mm-hmm. we're really talking about mindsets. You help your clients find out which mindsets are serving them and yeah. which stories they're repeating in their heads that aren't working. So it's not sure. necessarily a habit of doing, it's a habit of thinking. And then mm-hmm. you fix fix those, replace those with with yeah. patterns that serve them better. Mm-hmm. So what is a tool if someone who's listening here um wants to start paying attention what's a tool for finding a thought habit that's not working for them it's funny because i don't know that you always have to exactly identify them right i think you can start to create shifts without fully understanding what's wrong it's like you could sort of fix the car without knowing exactly how the engine works Mm -hmm. (laughs) in this area right i would i would offer this suggestion one of the tools i use with my clients is so it's old and it's been around a long time, but it's a book called The Greatest Salesman in the World. And in The Greatest Salesman in the World, there are these 10 scrolls and you can Google them or you can listen to them on YouTube. Like they're, yeah, you, know, that's you a can classic. access them anywhere. Yeah. It is a classic, but what the scrolls do and the subconscious mind is most open to receiving right when you wake up and right before bed. The scrolls are designed to be listened to three times a day. So in the morning when you wake up, after lunch, and then before you go to bed. And so when I'm working with clients, they always have a scroll that they're working with. And I've I've used the scrolls for 15 years of my life. And what they do is just start to replace some of those habits of thinking. Maybe that you don't even need to be able to name it or articulate it, but it will just, when you insert a new thought into your brain, you'll maybe make a shift in one conversation, or maybe you'll show up a little differently at this meeting, or maybe you'll enter into this with a different level of belief because of just those little tiny deposits. The work I do is not flashy. It is not fast. It is not like overnight success. It's very incremental. It's very sustainable. It's very long term. And it's actually lifelong. I don't know that you finish, right? It's not, yeah. you just, it's a journey that you're on forever. And so I love that actually, because there is nothing to fix. There's just something new to discover. And so I don't think that we need to. Um, diagnose as much as we need to move forward in new ways. Um, okay. No, and I, I love I, that. I like that too. That's mm-hmm. so in moving forward with those new ways. Yeah. Um, what do you suggest? Well, yeah. What do you suggest? Is, is yeah. there a tool like, are you suggesting listening to this book? Oh, the great assessment, or are you? Yeah. You know, what, and you, you actually, suggest? I would actually suggest my book too, because I talk about so many of the habits of thinking. The core message is that you can't outwork your thought habits. So if you feel that feeling, I can't work any harder. Some of the hardest working people I know are also under earning. They're not being paid what they're worth in exchange for the hours they're spending, right? And so if you would like to change that, I think you first have to just acknowledge that you can. At any time, you can choose a different thought, but just working more or harder is not going to move you forward like you want to. It's like if you're riding a bike in a very high gear, you can you will pedal, 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 pedal so fast, so fast, right? And if you'll just shift to a lower gear, you can pedal much slower 
and less and travel just as far, if not further. So that's what I'm talking about is this downshift into a deeper level of knowing your value, deeper level of understanding what's happening at a subconscious level, deeper level of showing up with worthiness and wholeness in life. And then you will start to receive an equal measure back. But there is no shortcut. There's not like, you can't skip it. (laughs) Well, and you have some great examples of that in your book too. Mm -hmm. So as we close up here, tell us where we can find your book and also Mm -hmm. what kind of coaching do you do? If listeners are interested in working with you, where do they go? So you can find me most easily at amykemp.com. And all the information about my coaching offerings is there, but it's very simple. I offer really uh, small groups of only women, eight to 10 women that I work through the Habit Finder curriculum in the fall and in the spring. So like school semesters, Uh, we meet every other week during the day via Zoom. So I have women from all over the country who are gathering in these small groups to work through this curriculum together. And then I work with clients one on one, much more tailored specific to their situation. We meet for Um, every other week for six or 12 sessions and working through these principles together, but applying them more specifically to your situation and what's happening in your world. The work is to me sacred. It is very sacred. So I love that. And then the book, of course, you can find all the places you can order it on amykemp.com, but it's everywhere you can buy books. So all of your Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org, all of those places. And it is on Audible. It's my voice recording it. So or reading it. So you can listen uh, to me talking to you through the book. I want the book to feel like a coaching session with me. So Mm -hmm. yeah. It is a lovely book. And on the show notes on loveyourstorypodcast.com for this episode, we will have a link to the Habit Finder tool and, of course, a link to purchase the book and the amykemp.com link. So you can go there and find it all. Amy, before we leave, any final words that you want to share, something we haven't talked about that you feel like is important for us to know? I think I would leave with just this. It's never too late. There's always hope. There's always a different story that will get you a different outcome. Like, I want you to feel that to your core, that even when you feel like you're in the deepest of ruts, it's not. Like, there's always a way forward. Um, However, it's rarely alone. So I would just say, extend a hand to someone, but We're designed to live in community and to travel together. And so um, when you're in that place, your most brave step a lot of times is just to reach out and say, like, I need help. I'm here and I need, you know, I don't know what to do to move forward. Well, and so often I find I don't know what to do to move forward. Like you'll get to a certain point and like, I I totally know the feeling you're talking about. It's like, I'm here, but I don't know what else to do to get past this. Like we so need each other. We so need help. We so need coaches. We so need people that can see our our way forward when we can't. Oh, amen. Yes. (laughs) Thank you for being here, Amy. Thank you so much. Oftentimes, our habits are something we aren't even aware of, as we mentioned earlier. In fact, I don't think I'm very aware of very many of mine. I hope our conversation today with Amy Kemp has given you a gentle awareness, maybe a reminder of how important it is to understand your habits, the things you're doing on autopilot, the things you're thinking on autopilot. These things are running our lives. They're running what we believe we're worth. They're running what we believe we can have, what we can do, who we are. They really are creating our reality. So to live intentionally, which is what this show is all about, is to be aware and to make choices actively. So if there are some of these things that we are stuck on, places that you're stuck in, maybe reaching out to Amy is the next step, getting some help or lining yourself up, um, seeing what shows up, seeing who shows up, but knowing that we can shift those stories in our heads, we can go into places of acceptance and a better flow. Um, So many things we talked about today. And I hope you found something, even if it's just one small piece for inspiration, for moving forward, 
Thank you for being here today. Blessings to you and yours. May you see your habits as they truly are and use your power of choice to shift the ones that you want to shift. We'll see you in two weeks for the next episode. Have fun living your life intentionally.